out. Everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. Joined in the studio is my full crew today. We've got my co-host, Austin. What's up, man? How's it going? I'm good. I'm good. And then we got behind the scenes producer, Daniel. How's it going, man? What's up, everybody? Daniel's been uh, very, very sick for the last couple of weeks, so he was actually not here with us on our last episode. Um, and then I'm kind of sick today. Just the sickness has been going around. And not only that, like I'm sure you guys have noticed, especially those that watch the show, that our lighting's been all over the place. Our audio was kind of off last week. It has been a major undertaking to try and upgrade the studio for some reason. But hopefully things are looking good, sounding good today. Because I swear, this has just been like the most cursed studio from day one. And the strangest things happen in here. Like we have issues where the cameras will just randomly reset themselves. Um, we'll have random little audio issues with no one. It's just none of it makes any sense. I mean, we've been racking our heads against Walt for so long. And I finally just decided to blame her. I mean, she's she's got to be the one fucking with everything in here. But hopefully everything looks and sounds good today. Let us know in the comments. But today we are bringing you another installment of one of my favorite series here on Lights Out, and that is Amusement Park Disasters. And today we have some especially brutal ones for you, honestly. Very tragic. And it's really interesting to, to look into these because almost every single one of them go back to just neglect by the park owners not willing to close rides because obviously that means loss of money for them. People leave if their favorite rides aren't open. And then what happens? And like a lack of regulation too. That back too. in the day, just people yeah, didn't care. Day. And like modern water parks and theme parks really didn't exist for a while. So they just didn't know what to expect. Yeah. When you start hearing some of the stories from some of these parks in like the, the 80s and the, even before that, I mean, the heyday. It, there was no like you just said there's no regulations or laws or really inspectors just kind of like up to the park owner to do what they wanted and obviously they assume liability no matter what for people to come ride their rides but it's insane what they were able to get away with for so long so this episode we'll be covering four different incidents two from australia actually one from china and one from new jersey here in the united states all very very wild but this episode of the podcast is brought to you by stamps.com. Also, some other great ways to support the show is just make sure you're following us on Spotify, subscribed on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. It does really help us out. It's free, just takes a second. You can join us for our YouTube premieres of our new episodes on Fridays at 1230 Mountain Standard Time. Austin is usually in the chat every week chatting with you guys. I know it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, we've had a blast in there. <laughs> it seems like it. I kind of go back and, and look through the chat replay and stuff. And sometimes I'm just kind of lurking and watching and just kind of seeing seeing what's going on. But it's been really fun to kind of get everybody sort of together and get a live reaction to some of the episodes. So, um, so we do that every week. But yeah, with all that being said, let's just go ahead and dive right in to this episode, starting with the Thunder River Rapids disaster. Rescue seasickness filled folk can jump aboard the Big Dipper at Luna Park. And if you have anywhere to leave your stomach, do so now before it leaves you. More than 30 people were riding the train when attendants saw black smoke pouring from entries and exits of the building. Share a dream at Dreamworld. And we reflect on the sounds and sights of children's joy at Action Park near Great Gorge. If you don't change your statement, Something's gonna happen. One of the oldest and most popular rides turned deadly. Uh, you almost lost count of the amount of failings. The question of whether this was a mass murder still lingering for the families of the seven that were killed. They're not what you call recognisable. Police are now offering a million dollars for information. The cover-up was monumental. You shiver and quake and the ghost train! <laughs> The first amusement park on our list today is one of Australia's most famous amusement park disasters. And it took place on October 25th, 2016 at the Dreamworld theme park on the Gold Coast in Queensland. When the park first opened in 1981, it only had a few attractions like an IMAX theater, a vintage car exhibit, a model train, 
and strange enough, a log flume. But as it grew, it added roller coasters and live animals, later becoming Australia's biggest theme park and zoo with over 40 rides and attractions. The different areas of the park have different themes, so some even feature large studio attractions from DreamWorks and Nickelodeon. But the town of Gold Rush section would soon become more famous than the big studio theme parks. This section of the park had the River Rapids ride, which first opened in 1986. Which this ride is a very common ride, I feel like, among theme parks. I know here in Colorado, we have Waterworld, which is a water park, basically. And then we have Elitch Gardens, which it's been a bunch of different names. It's probably not even that anymore. It's, it was Six Flags, Elitch Gardens, and it's been closed for a while because it's been going through new ownership and things like that. Very, very small, not impressive at all. Honestly, don't even go there. Like, it's kind of a waste of your money. Okay. <laughs> the rides are nothing thrilling. Um, I'll keep that in mind because I have been wondering about the parks around town. Yeah, they're not great. Waterworld, I would say, is worth going to, though. That's okay. a pretty fun water park. And and I can't remember. I believe it's Waterworld that has this similar ride to uh, Thunder River Rapids, where it's like the circular inner tubes with the seats on it. Yep. And it kind of sends you down these like artificial rapids and kind of around some corners it's a pretty chill ride for the most part like, yeah there's nothing you know it's not like there's crazy drops or anything yeah, like that no, it's like very family friendly yeah little yeah. kids can go little on kids it. go on it yeah. and stuff like that and it's just kind of like you twirl around and you just kind of go through and then you get off and most of the times you don't really get that wet either yeah unless you kind of are in one of the dips or something but right. it's a pretty pretty mild ride as far as excitement goes and at dream world it was considered to be one of the nine family rides in the park again like i said the design was nothing special it's very similar to a lot of other similar rides found around the world and even though this was one of the theme park's most popular attractions its innocent journey through the rapids would end in a bloodbath of mutilation with body parts caught between jaws of metal the main difference between this river ride and similar ones was that this one was custom built by the park it had several circular rafts which held about six people each and the rafts would flow down a 1300 foot long man-made river its top speed was only about 28 miles per hour and the whole ride only lasted for about four minutes and they would keep rotating guests in and out when the rafts completed the ride and returned to the boarding station riders could easily board and get off the ride without anything coming to a complete stop so you kind of hop off people hop on and it just kind of keeps on going Along the river, there was a tunnel and a few sections of whitewater rapids. Beneath the water, engineers made it so the raft would feel like it was getting bumped and thrown along a violent river, even though the whitewater was all simulated. As the rafts flowed along the slight downward slope of the river, their elevation would be a bit lower at the end of the ride. So a metal lift hill would then carry the raft back up to the boarding station where the riders could get off. This lift hill had a conveyor belt and the raft would be fed towards the hill and then towards the station. So just like the rafts, the water also had to be lifted back up to the beginning of the ride. There were two massive pumps which would carry the water from the end of the ride back up to the start. And everything worked like normal for years. But on October 25th, 2016, one of these water pumps failed. The water level of the ride suddenly dropped since only half the water was being returned to the start. And a raft that had just finished the ride reached the top of the lift hill but from the low water levels, the raft sunk lower and became stranded on a support rail just several feet from the boarding station. Behind this raft, another one was making its way toward the lift hill. This raft contained Kate Goodchild, her 12-year-old daughter, Kate's brother Luke Dorsett, his partner Ruzba Aragi, a New South Wales woman named Cindy Lowe, and Cindy's 10-year-old son. As the metal conveyor pulled the raft up the lift hill, they could see the raft ahead was stranded at the top. And behind the force of the lift, their raft slammed into the stranded one. And two more times, the conveyor belt smashed this raft into the one ahead. It hit the other raft so hard that their raft flipped 90 degrees, forcing it into a vertical position. From the force of the flip, Kate, Luke, Ruzba, and Cindy were all launched out of their seats and onto the conveyor belt. Luckily, the two children aboard the ride were able to hang on to their seats. This was Sydney's son and Kate's daughter. As screams filled the lift just before the boarding station, the conveyor belt was still churning. For some reason, 
the ride still hadn't been shut down. Onlookers and the first responding safety crew members watched as the teeth of this conveyor belt then grabbed some of the victims and dragged them under the raft. If they weren't crushed by the raft, the conveyor then dragged them and chewed them into the machinery below. All four of the victims were killed almost instantly. Some of the ride's workers witnessed the tragedy as the victims' limbs and intestines were dragged deeper into the ride. Three safety workers had been called right as the raft flipped. Their lawyer would later state that what they witnessed was a level of trauma beyond anything they had ever seen. And the victims' bodies were so badly disfigured from crush and compression injuries that these first aid officers were completely helpless. There was nothing they could do. While most people could only imagine what they saw, these first responders actually had to witness the violence for themselves. And the hardest memory to forget is the screams of the victims while their family members also stared and watched as their loved ones were eaten by this conveyor belt. Many of the family members yelled at the first responders, urging them to do something. But the tragedy happened in the blink of an eye. The responders wanted to do more, but the victims had already been swallowed by the machine. As for the two children on the ride, they were able to hang on until the conveyor belt was shut down, and then they climbed to safety. Immediately after the ride and the entire theme park were shut down, the next goal was to go and try to recover the victim's remains. So after rescue crews arrived, they drained all the water from the ride. But it took so long they had to wait until the next morning in order to recover the remains. First responders and paramedics tried their best to pry out what they could from the conveyor belt and machinery. What's crazy is that many of these responders would later require counseling sessions for the horrors that they saw. The sound and the feel of the body parts being removed from the metal teeth would stick with them forever. In the fallout of the disaster, Dreamworld shut down for a month for two reasons. One was out of respect for the dead, and the other was so that a thorough investigation could be completed. Their discoveries would end up taking years to reach the public though, but the results made it clear who was responsible. As it turned out, the park, its management, and its employees were entirely to blame. The magistrate later said, which is like a judge I believe in Australia, yep. steps were not that complex, were burdensome and only mildly inconvenient and really were inexpensive. Improvements to safety features were constantly deferred because of budgetary constraints. But even the most basic standard safety features were missing, like a water level indicator. This would have been an inexpensive way to alert if there wasn't enough water in the ride. Plus, no official risk assessment was ever completed for this ride. It was left to the staff to identify the risks, even though none of them were engineers. Most were teenagers looking for a summer job. On top of this, the emergency staff didn't even know where the emergency stop button was located. It was in the main control room, and no current employees had ever tested it before. When the investigation ended, the reports noted that everyone involved with the ride was responsible for the tragedy to some degree. Dreamworld executives and employees ended up fully cooperating with the investigation. And after almost four years after the tragedy, a long list of charges came their way under the Work Health and Safety Act. In July 2020, they pled guilty and took full responsibility. The theme park's parent company, Ardent Leisure, was fined $3.6 million dollars and this became the largest fine for a workplace accident in Queensland, Australia. Since then, the River Rapids ride never reopened and was torn down in November 2016, which couldn't even imagine them reopening that. Absolutely. And who the hell would want to get on that uh, after this? Yeah, right? Honestly. And I'm glad that they did this because this is the very least they could do. In 2022, they actually built a memorial garden for the victims. They absolutely should do that at the very least. During its design and construction, the park offered the victims' families to help with the design, but this actually angered two of the families who were still waiting for a payout from the tragedy. Ardent Leisure CEO Deborah Thomas had said she would donate 100% of her annual bonus to people affected by the tragedy, which was about $125,000 uh, when talking about US dollars. After the garden officially opened, some of the friends and family came to pay their respects. Only a month after the tragedy, though, Dreamworld reopened. Since then, they have increased many of its safety features across the park that is still operating today. But no one will soon forget the River Rapids tragedy. And obviously, the trauma that all the people who were there at the park that day, especially those that were, you know, perhaps waiting in line or were on the rafts themselves, can you imagine how they will ever shake the sounds of the screams and the images that they may have saw that day? 
before we move on to the next theme park disaster, which is also in Australia, I think it's important to hear from the victims' families um, of this of this incident because I think it really just shows the gravity of the situation, just how horrific this was and how traumatic it was. I mean, they lost their loved ones in probably one of the most gruesome and, and brutal ways, and it was preventable. And that's that's the most angering thing about it is that had they actually done safety checks, had the right people running the rides who knew how to stop it. They actually knew that the water was running. You know, they should have shut it down. As soon as the water levels drop, there should be like an auto shut off, right? Yeah. Especially for a ride like this. I mean, obviously there's dangers. I mean, not only the conveyor belt, but like what if it flips over and people are smacking their heads down the, because it's like concrete that right. they build underneath to create this sort of like artificial canyon. So I, I always thought of that too, like, being on those rides before like if i fall out of here it's not a good situation it's gonna be hard to climb out because the water's moving pretty quick and then you've got other rafts coming behind you so you can just get absolutely run over by another raft and get killed that way yeah and i think what we learned from this one it's really sad that something like this has to happen you know, know people have to get action is taken yeah and the other thing is i think what we learned from this too is that even the most family friendly rides are can be really dangerous when something goes wrong. Yeah, that's a really good point. But let's let's hear a little bit from the victims' families before we move on. And then um, the the incident happened, and we lost Cindy. That a lot of it could have been prevented. It has been a, a test of patience. I think it was um, it was good to hear the coroner give a very comprehensive uh, review of where the failings were uh, across many, many different areas at Dreamworld. Uh, you almost lost count of the amount of failings through that the coroner documented. Um, it's, it's quite overwhelming. We still live with the loss of Cindy, um, particularly Karen and Isla, uh, and their their journeys in life will be without their mother, um, and lots of us in the family, we miss her dearly uh, through this. I think it's gonna take me a little bit of time to to come to grips with with everything that's been, been found out. So long before the Dreamworld incident, the Luna Park ghost train disaster absolutely shocked Australia. And this is a tragedy that still haunts generations of Australians today. At 10.15 p.m. on June 9, 1979, a fire broke out inside Luna Park. The ghost train ride became an inferno, and black clouds of smoke could be seen billowing into the sky from miles away. Its blaze would end up trapping and killing almost an entire family. And what's crazy is that the cause of this fire is still a mystery to this day. There's theories, but we don't know 100% what causes fire. Located in Sydney, Luna Park sits on the northern shore of Sydney Harbour. The park's construction began in 1935 and opened on October 4th of that year, and it was an instant success. And the most popular ride at the time was the Big Dipper, a rickety roller coaster made of wood and metal. Over the years, the park grew even bigger, adding new ride designs inspired by ride engineering from across the globe. But some of the classic rides had rarely been updated. The other popular coaster in the park, the Ghost Train, was an indoor ride, which indoor rides always scare me because there's just something about being in a confined space yeah, with, with no way out, all this metal whirling around and machineries, and it's like if you're at the top of a roller coaster, like which I know they have like ladders and things like that, like they obviously have to now have ways to escape the ride. But even then, I mean, if there was a fire all around you at the bottom of of this coaster. I mean, what do you do? You're stuck. Like, yeah. And I don't, I don't know in the 1930s how conscious they were of like fire exits at oh, the time, no. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they weren't conscious at all. And just like the Big Dipper, the Ghost Train was old. It was actually built in a different park, Luna Park Glenolg, in 1931. And back then, it was called the Pretzel. The name was inspired by its track that twisted around tight corners and inside the confines of the small ride building. But after its move to the new Luna Park in Sydney, they reskinned the roller coaster, now calling it the Ghost Train. On the tracks inside the building, metal carts could hold two riders. 
The ride was so old, a ride attendant had to manually push a cart from the boarding station to get the ride going. That's concerning. I don't know if I'd ever get on a ride where somebody's like, all right, here you go. Here's jump on the cart here. No, nope, absolutely not. I'm like what? The cart then rode along the tracks into the dark rooms beyond. Riders passed by animatronic skeletons, the newest special effects, and hidden speakers that played creepy music and sound effects. This was just one of the many versions over the years, as they overhauled the design several times. But the actual carts and tracks had remained exactly the same since it was first installed in the park in 1936. This was basically the same for the safety features like the old fire sprinkler systems. Even though their fire extinguishing system was a bit newer than the coaster, everyone soon realized it wasn't going to be enough to keep a fire at bay by 1979. But even before then, there was alarming signs that the park's infrastructure was too old and poorly maintained. One of the park's oldest rides that once drew crowds by the hundreds was the old rickety Big Dipper. And on April 16, 1979, three train cars were cycling around the rails like they always had for the last three decades. But on one of the trains, a running wheel came loose and the entire train got stuck on the tracks. Then the following train rammed into the stranded one. Screams and crunching metal echoed through the park and the accident injured 13 people, but luckily no one died. But locals began questioning how old these rides were and how often they were actually maintained. Because only a few months later, tragedy struck again. But this time, the victims wouldn't be lucky enough to survive. At 10.15 p.m. on June 9, 1979, about 35 people were inside the metal carts on board the ghost train ride. Some of the park employees first noticed smoke seeping out of the main entrance and the exit tunnels of the ride. A fire had started somewhere deep inside the building, but no one knew where. So instead of stopping the ride, they kept cycling the metal carts through until they reached the end. This way, they thought they could evacuate the guests before shutting the ride down and extinguishing the fire. The firefighters arrived minutes later, but the fire now consumed almost the entire building. As they turned on their hoses, they realized the water pressure was extremely low inside of the park, so they had to start sucking up water from the nearby harbor. As the minutes passed, the fire transformed from simply a hazard into a blazing inferno. And within one hour, the entire building was up in flames. The structural damage soon forced the building to fall in on top of the rail lines. By now, firefighters and employees believed they had cycled all the carts out of the ride and evacuated all of the guests. But at 11.30 p.m., bodies were spotted through the smoke and wreckage. At first, as the investigators and first responders shined their flashlights across the smoldering rubble, they thought that the charred bodies were simply just the melted skeletal animatronics from the ride. But they knew something was wrong when one of the first remains they examined was the size of a young teenager. What they found out was that their skin had melted down to their bones from the intense heat inside of the building, and their eyes were completely gone. At this point, they really did look like an animatronic skeleton whose decorations and clothing had melted down to charred black bones. I was curious about how hot fires get, because I actually never really knew. The average house fire is about 1,200 to 1,500 degrees, which I can't even really comprehend how hot that is. Um, but they say maybe a building like this, if an entire big building goes up in flames, it can get up to 2,000 degrees. I so mean, an incinerator, basically. Yeah. I mean, imagine like how hot when you turn on the oven to cook like 450 degrees. Oh, I know. I've hand, touched, it's like, touched the oven before at like 450 or 500 before. So even that's Ooh. really hot, right? So you like quadruple that. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about melting away yeah. everything. That's correct. So hopefully... These victims only died from smoke inhalation. That's how most people perish in, in big building or house fires. It's the smoke will get you before the fire does. In big buildings, it can be a little bit different. But if they died from being caught on fire, their end would have been way more horrific than it was. So we can just hope that hopefully the smoke got to them and they were unconscious before then. And I looked up people who have experienced high temperatures and, and lived to tell the tale. One guy said he came close to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit because he was wor he was working with metal. Oh, wow. Like a welder type? Yeah. Oh, wow. Or he was, smelting it was, or it was like iron rods he oh, was okay. smelting. Yeah. yeah. And he said he, he got close to 1,000 degrees. His hand got close to it. And he said he could feel his skin melting. It felt wet. Oh, that's crazy. So... Imagine. So it literally like drips off of you. Yeah, it feels melting because like all, all the friction is gone. 
there's just nothing left. Your skin just be- and your skin's so thin to begin with. So. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Let's hope that smoke at Got least rendered burn. them unconscious before being burned. I mean. Yeah, which is most likely the case. Um, but that's why in the old days when you got burned at the stake it was no joke like they wanted to make sure that you were tortured before you died so people who have died luckily that's you know those days are mostly behind us but um that's a horrific way to go for sure yeah that pain can last a long time um but most of the time your body goes into shock it gets really intense but then you go into shock and your nervous system is basically destroyed so i would say it'd be hard to remain conscious with that amount of pain yeah for that long so hope to god that they were taken by other means oh man so in the ghost train fire there were seven victims in total the victims included a father john godson and his two young sons damien and craig john visited the park earlier in the day with his two sons and wife jenny They'd planned to head home, but decided last minute that the ghost train would be their last ride. Jenny didn't want to join them, so while John took his sons on the ride, she went to go get some ice cream for herself, and they agreed to meet at the ride's exit. Although this decision saved her life, she literally had to suffer the loss of her entire family. As investigators discovered more bodies, they realized that John had been the only adult victim. The six others were only children. The four other victims in the fire were four high school students from the nearby Waverly Boys College, Jonathan Billings, Richard Carroll, Michael Johnson, and Seamus Rahili. And they are all between the ages of 12 and 13. And none of the victims were found in their carts. The park employee's idea of cycling all the carts out of the building had backfired. They didn't realize that some of the riders got out of their seats to try and find emergency exits. The dark rooms inside were filled with smoke, and as minutes passed, it became harder and harder to see and breathe. Eventually, they either fell to the ground, unconscious from smoke inhalation, or they caught on fire, surrounded by the growing inferno. Although the exact reason for the fire remains a mystery, the cause was written off as faulty electronics. But as decades passed, many believe that the cause was something much more bleak, and arson might have been involved. One theory even suggested that the fire was caused by a demon. Jenny Godson had gone to get ice cream instead of joining her husband and sons on the ride, and she barely dodged death that night, but she was left without a family and a massive hole in her heart. When she later developed the photos with her family from that day, she noticed a peculiar picture of her son. The last picture of Damien Godson shows him standing next to a terrifying figure. It stood over six feet and wore a demonic mask made of cowhide. And if you're looking at this, this thing is absolutely terrifying, honestly. When I saw this, I was like, they're allowed to wear this with kids around like right. i mean it's i mean it's not like it's like gruesome or anything but it's just creepy it's just yeah, it's a pretty terrifying figure if you can look at a picture of it yeah like maybe on halloween uh, yeah you, you could see something like this but just an you know just a normal day at the park so this individual had black hair that drooped over the large horns that came out of the sides of its skull and many believe that this might have been some sort of pagan creature or unidentified demon Witnesses said that the figure randomly approached the child, took a picture of him, and then left. He shared a resemblance to the Canaanite god, Moloch, who was known for his obsession with child sacrifice. While the fire could have been started by something supernatural, others began looking to police corruption. The lead detective at the time of the fire was a man named Doug Knight. And in recent years, it was revealed that Doug was a quote-unquote fixer. He would often change, delete, and manipulate evidence, and sometimes he would even intimidate witnesses so that they wouldn't testify. Years later, it was discovered that he was also being paid off by at least one organized crime ring throughout his career. And the running theory alleged that Doug was paid off to cover the tracks of a man named Abraham Gilbert Saffron, who went by Abe. I had never heard of Abe Saffron. Maybe some of our Australian listeners would know who this guy is, because I guess he was pretty big at the time. Um, He was a hotel owner, nightclub owner, owned some property... Uh, In the late 1900s, he became known as one of the major figures in Australian organized crime. Most of his operations were out of King's Cross, New South Wales, and for several decades, he was involved in a slew of crimes. If you can think of anything in the mafia-related crime 
he was doing cycle. it. He yeah, was involved he was, in it. Yeah, wow. absolutely. So drugs, prostitution, gambling, tax evasion, bribery, extortion, et cetera, et cetera. From his notoriety, he ended up getting the nicknames Mr. Sin and the Boss of the Cross because he from the King's Cross. Of, yeah. yeah. Wow. And after decades of running his criminal enterprise, he later died in 2006 from complications from a leg infection. Hmm. Among all his other business ventures, he was also focused on property development, and supposedly he had his eye on owning the lease for Luna Park. Oh, wow. But it was only after his death that a slew of reports about his connection to the fire finally came to light. Yeah, because apparently in 2007, his niece told authorities that he had commanded the fire as part of a plot to take over the lease. So I guess he was thinking, burn it down, like cause this horrific tragedy to occur, and therefore the owner would be forced out of the lease yep. and it would become available and he would go and take it over. Is that right? Yep, that's it. And I think his niece kind of came forward in 2007, not coincidentally that he had passed. I mean, she was waiting to for him to go before... Yeah, the beans on these everything. guys can be pretty scary right? yeah so, right right i can imagine he probably was like you got to keep quiet about this right according to her though she said that he never intended for anyone to die even when he was still alive many thought abe might have been involved but he always denied it and since there was no proof thanks to doug knight covering up the tracks abe was never charged years later it became clear that the corrupt police and politicians had covered up many of abe's crimes one retired police analyst, Steve Bullock, eventually came forward in 2021, and for him, there was quote-unquote no doubt Saffron was behind that fire at Luna Park. Steve then looked into Abe's links with the company that eventually won the Luna Park tender in 1980, which a tender is basically an invitation to bid for a government project, and in this case, new tenders would take over the park. As it turned out, Abe's nephew, Sam Cowper, became the financial controller and his cousins Solman and Harold Goldstein became shareholders and directors. Abe's gaming machine company also had 100 machines installed in the park. An eyewitness named Les Dowd later told investigators he had seen a group of bikers near the front of the ghost train on the day of the fire. At least two other witnesses who were employees also saw the bikers that day too, but they were never asked for an interview by police, which is very fishy. They all wore the same clothing too, knee-high boots, blue jeans, and leather jackets and Les then heard one of them talking about spreading out kerosene and lighting a match. Three other witnesses claimed that they had smelled kerosene in or near the ride. Police then pressured Les to change his story. He was only 17 years old at the time, so he changed his official witness statement, and he said he had previously made up seeing the men. Only decades later was he comfortable with telling his truth. Investigators reopened the case in 2021, but the fire and the deaths of the seven riders still haven't been officially solved. Officials are offering a $1 million reward for information on the fire, even if it doesn't lead to an arrest or conviction. Today, many now believe that Abe Saffron was the one who orchestrated the fire that day, and he got away with it. But Luna Park continues to operate while millions visit every year. The names of the victims are now memorialized on a small plaque at the Big Top Arena where the ghost train once stood. What do you think about this theory of saffron being behind this i'm pretty convinced i i mean there's there's like a three-part documentary that we had found on it that people really dig deep into this and i thought it was pretty clear while researching that the evidence points to to him this guy yeah and if not him he was at least the mastermind behind it yeah what's interesting to me is that they saw a biker gang because there's actually a massacre that happened in Australia. And, and don't quote me on any of this. I'm just pulling from memory right now. But I believe one of the biggest massacres that occurred, and definitely the biggest biker massacre that's ever occurred in the entire world, was a biker gang in Australia. Really? Violent. Like, shootout, innocent people died. And so it's interesting to me that if Saffron was associated or are involved with this biker gang in some sort or if he paid them off to do this in some way it makes a lot of sense because i'm just not buying that there was an electrical failure that ends in an inferno i mean an electrical failure uh, something like that i mean i feel like it would take some time before the blaze got to an inferno level it seems to me that there was accelerant involved in this fire yeah to make it as big as it as it did really really quick for and sure. hot yeah and with this 
biker thing again i i'm not really too in depth researched on mafia related stuff in australia but i don't know if maybe this is like their cartel ish yeah this is like i think it is they use biker gangs to commit crimes i think it's one of the more complex organized crime rings they have in, in australia is these biker gangs and they are responsible for some really horrific stuff and i wouldn't put arson past them by yeah them, so especially when you connect the dots after that what was it his cousins and his nephew were all taking hold and they installed a bunch of his arcade machines so he's right. clearly it's, profiting he's, off he's of invested in the park and that's what i mean you got to think about motive and i think he had motive yeah clear motive to want something bad to happen at the park and i feel like to be like oh you know in hindsight to be like yeah i didn't want anybody to die it's like okay dude like nobody's buying that yeah you knew there's a possibility that somebody could this could get out of hand and 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 in people's lives being lost it's just sad that it ended up being as many as it was and and children at that so right. we're just there having a good time at the park and it's the last ride they ever go on it's just yeah, yeah. and his, his niece said that he hadn't planned on anyone dying but at that point, if you're committing arson with people inside a building, yeah. you absolutely are planning to potentially kill people. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it you know, takes us back to the case that we just covered where, you know, the burglars burn the house down. We're like, oh, you know, we're just trying to cover our evidence, but it's like there's people inside. Yeah. So you assume the responsibility that you could potentially kill those people right. by setting the house on fire. So I 100% agree with that statement. But the ghost train fire might still be a mystery on paper but more complicated amusement ride disasters are true engineering mysteries or even possibly secrets. And the more complex the ride, the more devastating the carnage. Many believe that the disaster of Space Journey is officially the worst amusement park disaster ever. The ride was built to be a simulation of Apollo 11. It had once taken you through the launch sequence into the cosmos and then the moon landing, but its run didn't last long. Shortly after opening, the ride ended up killing several people and injuring many more on June 29th, 2010. The ride was located inside a park over in Shenzhen, China at OCT EcoVenture. This was a major resort complex that was constructed from 2004 to 2007. It had eight hotels and over a dozen restaurants that existed inside of the resort. But its Night Valley theme park became one of the most popular reasons to visit. The other parks and attractions mostly focused on scenery and low intensity rides. So if guests wanted to have some real fun, they would go over to Night Valley. Here the themes were the deepest oceans and the farthest reaches of space. The theme behind Space Journey was that there was a simulated natural disaster that was going on or that was imminent and it was the guest's goal in order to save the planet. In 2010, the main attraction that had the most intensity was Space Journey. The ride itself was inside a building in the dark. So no known photos of the actual mechanics of the ride exist for public viewing. But the main concept was a centrifuge ride that simulated space. So for those that don't know, a centrifuge ride is where guests sit in an enclosed capsule and it usually spins around a central point. That's the gist of it. Obviously, there's a bit more complications yeah. when you get into the engineering. But have you ever been to Mission Space at Epcot? Ah, uh, yes, I believe it's, so. It's the one that yeah. simulates like the the launch takeoff. I think you're going to Mars. There's yeah. like a there's like a high intensity one and a low intensity. Oh, one. I haven't been on that. Then oh, it's just weird. I've been to Epcot, but I haven't. Oh, you know what? I couldn't go on it because my dumb ass didn't get the the fast res, res, the reservation shit. Yeah. You have to like reserve. We, I yeah. remember we we just randomly went one day and we were very very disappointed that we couldn't ride most of the cool stuff there because unless you had you know you paid for a fast pass or had like the reservations for it yeah and just screwed <laughs> i'm not i'm not a simp for disney by any means but i will say this ride was one of the craziest rides i've ever really? been on yeah there's their engineering if you ever want to look it up is insane how they do their centrifuge huh. ride it's absolutely are nuts. you sitting down in it like strapped into something yeah you're strapped down in this enclosed module and you have you have like a mission to do you have to like press buttons oh it's okay not that yeah. complicated but they shoot you into space and you land on i think mars i can't really remember you have to do a few other things and they launch you back but it's weird because you're watching a simulation while the centrifuge which you have no visuals of is is like whipping around 
Oh, wow. Yeah, it's crazy. Look up videos of the engineering of that shit. It is wild. Um, that's the only thing I'll simp so for. So it's pretty for realistic then? They, they say it's pretty realistic. Yeah, it's. I mean, that's essentially how they train astronauts is in centrifuge. Oh, cool. Yeah. That does sound fun. So this one wasn't engineered to a, a tight degree, but essentially a centrifuge is just meant to simulate G-force. Right. So like one G is one of earth's gravity right, right right so if you if you're talking 5g that means it is five times the force of earth's gravity on your body astronauts use these to simulate the effects on your body which is really important before obviously hopping into a real life rocket ship you yeah, know your body the, has to adjust to it even fighter pilots too fly exactly fighter um, planes because they pull g's in those as well yeah they yeah if you pretty high g's too yeah, yeah it's yeah. honestly crazy I, I, I love watching i mean there's there's a great uh compilation video on youtube of of like pilots going through this training this g-force training and just watching like their faces like <laughs> yeah just sag the completely. blood yeah they have to like just keep, sucked out of yeah and they have to do these weird techniques to keep like shoving blood up into their yeah. brains so they don't pass out yeah yeah they do that thing like if you've ever seen the new top gun movie uh they actually put the actors in g-force that's good so you could see if you want to see tom cruise like the veins coming out of his forehead well yeah and if you don't if you don't do it right you just pass out yeah yeah Yeah. exactly which is obviously dangerous when you're flying a you know five million dollar plane yeah exactly you're gonna crash that thing yeah yeah that's crazy i've always wanted to experience that yeah i say that but maybe not (laughs) i hear it's very intense um and you have to go through training to just figure out how to do those exercises but most of us are familiar with if you ever uh, it's common at like carnivals and stuff if you ever been to those rides where you you stand against the wall it starts spinning and then the floor drops out oh yeah yeah that's essentially like a centrifuge ride it's the g-force is now pushed against the wall so that you can stay against it while the floor drops so just if you could wrap your head around those physics, that's essentially what's going on here in a nutshell. Um, but what made it different from just a regular old centrifuge ride was that much like the mission space, it's you're all in these capsules. I think it was four seater capsules that was had connecting arms. Made right, metal. to the main. So it had multiple capsules going at one time. Yep. Right? Yeah. And it had one... 50 foot pole in the right. very center and it goes up and down on exactly that pole. yeah in the dark <laughs> yeah in the dark so and then to simulate that's a that's essentially how they simulated like the launches and stuff on your they wanted the g-force on your body right. going upwards right. and and side to side and whatnot so that was the gist of this ride that they were trying to build so what happened was is that this ride was going on as normal when one of the arms that connected to one of the capsules so like we we're just saying the arm to the main you know sort of central pole capsule it failed each capsule weighed around five tons and as the g-force of the ride put even more strain on the connecting arm it finally gave away on june 29 2010 at 4 49 p.m at least 40 people were on the ride when the capsule surged upwards along the central pole the ride simulated a rocket launch when all hell broke loose at the exact point when the capsules reached 39 feet in the air, one of them detached from its connecting arm. It was spinning around at speeds that were never released to the public, but it was very fast. Half the bolts that connected the arm to the capsule snapped in half, and those that didn't snap shot out from their metal threads. So this five ton capsule blasted off of the ride and then crashed into the surrounding walls. Under serious momentum, the capsule then smashed and bounced along the interior walls of the building, tumbling down toward the floor 39 feet below. Inside the capsule, the riders violently bashed into the walls and each other, while the outside shrapnel shot across the room. And by the time the capsule reached the floor, all four passengers inside were dead and mangled together with the seats in each other. Other passengers who were inside the adjacent capsules heard an ear-shattering bang and immediately smelled burning rubber. And for some, this was their last memory before waking up in the ICU. What's worse is that once the detached capsule had reached the ground, it then burst into flames. Some say it was from an electrical component inside the ride or an exterior control panel. As fire spread across the capsule, smoke quickly filled the room while the other capsules were still 50 feet in the air, spinning around that central pole. 
Luckily, the ride made its way back to the ground floor, but not without a few capsules smashing into the fatal capsule on the ground. As the capsule doors unlocked, the other riders scrambled from their seats, and they noticed the inflamed capsule sat right in front of the exit doors. Minutes passed as smoke continued to fill the room, and some of the guests began passing out from smoke inhalation. But luckily, firefighters soon arrived to put out the flames and move some of the debris to make an opening for the exit. Once they were fully inside the room, they found some of the guests were unconscious, so they had to carry dozens of people out of the building. Two had already died of smoke inhalation, and four had died from the impact. At least ten more were hospitalized. But after the dust settled, the public wanted answers, as you can imagine. They needed to know who was responsible. Was it neglect, poor maintenance, or faulty manufacturing parts? Neither the company that owned the ride or public officials have offered a clear explanation as to why the ride failed that day. All the local government did was hold a press conference for the park executives to make a public apology. So the only thing the surviving victims and the families were left with were theories. Some thought that there was a power surge in the building moments before the disaster. One eyewitness claimed that lights flickered right before the crash. Others said it was an electrical fire, a small explosion, or a mechanical failure. But the exact cause remains a mystery. Supposedly, the equipment for the ride was tested and certified as safe by the China Special Equipment Inspection and Research Institute. In the aftermath, the resort ended up compensating the victims an undisclosed amount. And many think the resort only wanted to avoid a lawsuit since the income from this resort and its theme parks were crucial to the region. But the resort might not have been entirely responsible. Many pointed fingers at Beijing Zhuhua Amusement Rides Manufacturing Company. They are known for taking the designs of better engineered rides and recreating them using cheaper materials, which, what a great business to be in, huh? Potentially risking lives to make more money. But the Space Journey ride wasn't a knockoff like their other rides, and this was actually one of their few original prototype rides, but it completely failed. We're not sure if the company was ever sued after the tragedy, but the company is still constructing rides today. As far as we know, public officials have never officially released the cause of failure for the ride even after a decade has passed, and the victims and their families might never know who or what was responsible. Which I think largely this is because this is China, and in China things just work very differently. Yeah. Especially when it comes to government agencies being held accountable for things, and I think corporations just have a ton of power there as well. Yeah, and I can imagine like their regulations probably aren't the same to our standards. Yeah. And the fact that there was no pictures of the ride of inside yeah. the ride have yeah. ever been released. Everything is very hush hush. Uh, Even was, on the internet too. There's not a whole lot on it. Yeah. I think the only picture I could find was, uh, one of the first responders like carrying out a victim or something like wow. that. But besides that, there was almost absolutely nothing I could find. There's obviously a theme to these inside coasters and more major type of rides are seemingly more dangerous. It seems like it's dangerous to have so much heavy duty machinery operating with people on board inside of a building, confined space, right? Yeah, especially when a fire breaks out. Right. And what I assume is that there's only one exit that they built in this building. Yeah, that's kind of crazy to think that because I, I would imagine that in any of the parks here in the United States, there'd be like multiple, multiple emergency exits yeah. like for it to be up to code. Absolutely. But in China, yeah, the one exit was blocked. Right. And I don't know, the fact that they chose this manufacturing company. Yeah. So they're known for knockoffs, specifically for using cheaper material to cut costs. But this wasn't even a previously engineered ride by another company. What I was looking into, they they take like, okay, if an American ride has really good engineering, they will replicate it exactly, but they would just use much cheaper parts. Whereas I think the key difference between those and this one is that this was an original from this cheap manufacturing company. So right. it seems like it was almost bound to fail. Yeah, that's a good point. I can't believe it's already April. 2023 has been going by way too fast. But one thing that's absolutely helped my businesses this year is Stamps.com. We've been sponsored by Stamps.com for a number of years now, and I absolutely love the service that they provide. 
They have saved me so much money on postage when it comes to our merch store or my CBD company. We're talking up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates. But one of my favorite things about stamps.com is it eliminates the need to go to the post office. I don't know about you, but the post office is probably the last place I want to spend any of my time in. There's always a line out the door and I just swear they use like some 18th century technology in that place. It just takes so long. So skip the line, skip the drive to the post office and do everything right from home or your office on an ordinary computer. As long as you've got a printer, you can print postage. And then once you get your postage all figured out for all your packages, you can schedule a USPS pickup or UPS pickup right from the dashboard. It's that simple. Stamps.com saves you so much time and money. With that being said, there's no reason to not try out Stamps.com today. Set your business up for success when you get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code lights out for a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code lights out. So, like you've been hearing this whole episode, and just with amusement park disasters in general, we're usually covering one ride within one amusement park. But when it comes to action park, we have to completely throw all that out the window because we're talking about a whole park that was notorious for creating death traps across its entire property. This one is is infamous for many reasons, and HBO actually did a documentary on it, uh, which is really interesting, definitely worth checking out, because the fact that this thing was ever even allowed to operate truly blows my mind. At Action Park, in Vernon, New Jersey. We're gonna cover a number of different disasters that happened across the entire fucking park. On May 26, 1978, Action Park opened its doors, and for the next two decades, this would be the home of countless bloodshed and death. With a theme park and water park that would never pass today's standards, this entire plot of New Jersey was just a death trap. Over the years, at least six people died and hundreds ended up in the hospital. But in its early years, it was just a dream where kids could have the most fun possible. It was started by Eugene Mulvihill, the owner of Great American Recreation. After the rise of Action Park, he would later joke that he was the Walt Disney of New Jersey. His company also operated the Great Gorge Ski Area in Vernon. But Eugene had bigger plans for the property. Skiing was only good for winter revenue. So to make some cash during the summer months, Eugene added the infamous alpine slide down one of the ski slopes. Nearby, he also added two water slides. And on flat ground, he installed a go-kart track and he called this Vernon Valley Summer Park, and then it was later changed to Action Park. Over its 250 acres, they carved out the nearby swamplands and installed one of North America's earliest modern water parks. Eugene wanted to draw guests in for the thrill and intensity of the rides. At its largest peak, the park had 75 rides, 35 were motorized or self-controlled rides, and 40 were water attractions and slides. Eugene didn't want to build just another park where you get strapped into a ride on rails. He wanted the freedom of user-controlled fun. That sounds like a great idea. Super safe. Yeah. Where the guest safety was up to you. Which is like <laughs> always a bad idea to leave safety up to the individual. It sounds fun, but what we know about amusement park rides now, I don't know. Not a great idea. Well, I think here's the thing though, is I think people likely went under the assumption that even though I can control the thrill of the ride, I'll probably be safe, right? Like, yeah, yeah. You know, it is a park I paid to go into. Like, you know, whether I sign a waiver or not, I mean, what's the worst that could happen? What could go right? wrong? You yeah. Know, there's no possibility that I could not come home from the park today. Yeah. Everyone's right? the main character, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And soon enough, no one doubted how intense Action Park really was. It hit its popularity peak in the early to mid 80s. And at this point, a million people visited the park every year. So, oh, dude, he's rolling in the dough. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, the word gets out. There's this park where you can control your own intensity. Like, I mean, who doesn't want to do that? I, I love thrill rides and going, you know, intense experiences and things like that. And Same. honestly, I'd probably want to go check this place out, too. Yeah, let's go. Because, I mean, um, there's probably, ton. you know, there's a small portion of people that are when you talk about millions of people visiting the park, I mean, six people died, which is obviously terrible and should never happen in any park. And then a few hundred people may be injured, but out of the millions and millions of people, 
one could look at the statistics there, probability, right. and be like, like, most people, most people are fine, right? Yeah. So they should put that as their headline: Action Park. Most people make it out. Yeah. Only one percent die. So yeah, or point zero zero five percent die. Right. And at this point, the park hadn't gotten the reputation of of being a death trap quite yet, but still, injuries were pretty common, and the main culprit was the Alpine Slide. The ride was first advertised as a simple, family-friendly ride. The park claimed that grandfathers could ride down the slide, and even a mother holding her infant had safely made it to the bottom, which I'm questioning questioning that mother a little bit right. on bringing your infant down that slide. No helmets. No, no way nothing. I would do that with my daughter. Yep. I don't even know if I trust most playgrounds these days. Like, No. Kids get kids fall for those or hot or, you know. I mean, I wouldn't even trust myself on one of these, let alone holding a an infant, infant child yeah. yeah my god but not long after opening it got a different kind of reputation guests had to sign a release form to go down the slide that ran 2700 feet down the ski slope it was constructed of concrete fiberglass and asbestos the three things that i absolutely wouldn't want to come in contact with <laughs> have you ever have you ever uh played around with like fiberglass insulation and like gotten that on your skin yeah Oh, dude. We, we used to have it in, in my parents' old attic until they replaced it all because they realized it was like no good. But no, it's it's so rough. Yeah, well, and it's like, I think it little pieces of fiberglass get like lodged in your skin and stuff. Yeah. I remember when I was younger, I, one day I thought I was just playing with like foam or something and I started like pulling it out of somebody's house or something. <laughs> and then I went home that night and I was just like, ah, ah. I just like, you feel like, <laughs> Little this, things are inside almost like your yeah, skin. almost yeah. like having an allergic reaction to something. But it, yeah, it was horrible. Oh, really? You had an allergic? Oh, oh, you mean from like yeah? The, well, I was all like, like a red. rash. Yeah, yeah, it was like a rash. It yeah. was like, but I was like kind of red and wow. just felt. I was like, what? What happened to me? And I didn't even realize what fiberglass was. Nobody told me not to play with fiberglass insulation. My parents yelled at me when really we, they caught my brother and I up in the attic, and for sure. But think about a slide made out of concrete and asbestos. I mean, great combination there, concrete. Like I get concrete smooth and you can kind of get that, you know, nice smooth ride down, but don't let your skin run on that. Have yeah, you ever right. like skinned your yes. knee on concrete? Yeah, not recently, Yeah, but when I was a kid running around for sure. Yeah, I had an unfinished basement with concrete floors and like we'd run around and then, you know, we'd have like airsoft wars in the basement. Oh, I'd be man. like sliding on my knees and stuff like in my jeans and then afterwards I'd be like, oh, these burns. It's kind of like rug burns, you know, yeah. like the concrete burns are just like, scratch you up oh yep. so the way that this slide would work is that single riders would straddle a small plastic board with four wheels on it so wheeled board we're not talking like a little rug going down the slide like there's alpine slides here in colorado up in essays uh, park there's a, a a slide it's not this big or anything but you know you get on a little carpet and you just kind of like go down you don't go fast or anything it's yeah. like pretty or, mild ride i've seen the ones that you're actually on a track and you oh, have the break, yeah. you know, with even like that seems more safe because alpine coasters on. are what yeah, they're called. Exactly. Yeah. And you can break and stuff, but not this. You're basically like getting on a skateboard on a 2700 foot ramp. Right. <laughs> with no, no nothing yeah, to stop you. They had brakes, but they like were shoddy as all hell. Yeah. And probably throw you from your board. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. It's either, it's either a hundred miles an hour or Flip zero. Yeah. yeah. So they controlled the speed of the board with the pole lever connected to it between the rider's legs. So it's kind of the, you know, similar to like the Alpine coaster thing where you got your, you know, brake in the middle there. Yep. So at the top of the ride, they were often warned about applying the brake before sharp turns or if they approached another rider ahead of them. But there were two major problems with the ride. The brakes often didn't work and many complained that you basically had only two speed choices on the slide extremely slow or a speed that one employee described as death awaits <laughs> oh, god <laughs> and even if the brakes did work properly riders didn't want to use them because who wants to slow down at an action park you go to the action park to go fast exactly so this often led to carts flying off the track plus helmets weren't required which what is that mind-blowing like, come on at the very least make people wear a helmet like this doesn't affect the intensity of the ride yeah, and we're in the 80s here i feel like helmets, helmets were, were come on people were rollerblading in. with helmets come on why weren't we wearing helmets on 2700 feet <laughs> ski slopes here but not only that to get on this ride riders were allowed to have swimsuits on because again there's a water park there so you'd go for both and a lot of people just wear their swimsuit all day oh yeah and so you know everybody knows swimsuits not not providing a lot of padding for you nope. that's for sure 
So as their carts jumped the slide, riders would leave a bright trail of red blood and skin behind them on the concrete. Oh my Ooh. god. Just can see them like at, at the end of the day, they're like getting the power washer out, just like shh. Yeah. There's just like this stream of red water coming yeah. down the slide. Like brutal, man. Because as they skidded and tumbled, their injuries would cover them in nasty cuts, scrapes, and bruises. And after an accident, other riders would come racing down the slide behind the injured riders, skidding through that streak of blood, and then slam into them because their brakes failed. Some cracked their skulls hard enough to get concussions, and countless others broke their bones. Eventually, this ride caused the first ever fatality that happened at Action Park. In 1980, a 19-year-old named George Larson Jr. decided to ride down the slide. It was after sundown and a rainstorm had moved in. With no brakes, a slick track, and no sunlight, he lost control of his cart and it jumped the track. He went airborne and when he crashed into the ground, his friends literally heard the audible sound of his skull cracking as it landed directly on a rock. Employees and other riders noticed he wasn't moving after the impact so they ran to help, but when they reached him, he didn't respond. His head rested in a pool of blood before any paramedics could reach him and rush him to a hospital. After spending several days in a coma, George eventually died. He had been a ski lift operator at Vernon Valley during the winter months, and since he was an employee, the park officials made the excuse that his death didn't need to be reported to state regulators. What? How was that? How was that a loophole? Isn't that insane? Yeah, let's just not tell anybody about this. Yeah, one of our what? employees just died on one of our rides. So that was a, a lie, clearly, in order to cover up his death. And supposedly, state inspectors had already looked at the Alpine slide during an earlier visit and told the park to remove the nearby rocks. Which, why the hell would there be rocks near a slide where you can jump the tracks? That seems so. If anything, put some padding or something. Right. And if you were, I don't know if this was a retired ski slope or if it was they kind of carved a new path down it. But if this used to be a ski slope, why the hell are there rocks? Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Which I guess, I mean, during the winter, snow's covering a lot of rocks oh, true, on the side yeah. of, of mountains and stuff. So there's, you know, usually the, you know, it's not like they clear all the rocks from the mountain. True, you know I mean? yeah. Very so it's probably true. the snow just melted. But still, clear the rocks away. Like, or put some padding over them or something. And that's they, such a hazard. They knew that those, they were jumping the tracks. Like, they knew they already had injuries and they still didn't even bother to. So this is crazy. This is what their solution is to this problem. So after George dies, the park employees dumped a bunch of hay bales just outside the sharp curves to try and cushion the blows. Mm, not the best padding, I would say. No. Nope. You know, it might cushion it a little bit, but your head's going to still crack. Have you ever fallen on a hay bale too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If, they're, if they're still wound tight, they're, they're pretty hard. They're it's not really basically cushioning. like hitting the ground. Yeah, right. <laughs> It's no different. I mean, I guess if you like spread it out and like yeah, fluffed it up, made it nice. And it also depends on this type of hay as well. There's different types of hay, and some are very, very stiff, firm, and some are softer. Oh, which hay, like okay. Timothy hay, depending on the cut, like depending on the cut. Of, uh, the only reason I know this is because I have rabbits, and oh yeah, I was so, wondering. Yeah, why. okay. And, and I've learned a lot about hay. Um, but there's different, cu- so they do different cuts of it. There's like first, second, and third cut. Third cut being, I believe, the softest of of the hay cutting. And so that bale is going to be significantly a softer because it's kind of the end piece versus the first cut. So it just depends on the hay too. So maybe it was, you know, some soft hay or something, but what, still. The big question is what's the cheapest, do you know what the cheapest hay is? Uh, it would say it's not Timothy. Timothy's nice hay. Uh, it's, there's, there's a few, few out there. There's definitely some cheap ones. That's probably the cheapest one. They're, that's yeah. what I would assume they're throwing on the sides of the slides here. Yeah. I don't see how that really helps anything at all um, this slide would continue to stay open until the park closed over a decade later and even though this was the only fatality on alpine slide countless other riders injured themselves between two years alone 1984 and 1985 this slide was a direct result of 14 bones snapping and 26 severe head injuries which i don't see how that's any better than dying I mean, right. a severe head injury can in- impact you for life at one point, Action Park fronted the bill to get Vernon all new ambulances since paramedics had to visit the park so often. My God. Isn't that a, just a huge tell? Yeah. That the guy's like, okay, we'll buy all new ambulances because <laughs> this is... My park is so dangerous. We got to beef up the local first responders here. Rather than make the ride safer, let's just... Buy more ambulances. The, yeah. <laughs> so more victims can be taken out of my park. Yeah. 
more swiftly. So by this point, Action Park had developed a very rough reputation. Since the park could get away with countless injuries and even death, there was no reason to stop building dangerous rides. So another insane ride at Action Park was over at the section of the park called Motor World. This used to be a snake-filled swamp with snapping turtles hiding in the dark waters. But the area was renovated, and the snakes that remained luckily didn't bother anyone, as far as we know. A popular ride here was the Super Go-Karts, and like the slide, their drivers were also in control of their speed inside of these single rider vehicles. Which I mean, as a kid, that's like amazing. You're like, yeah, you know, I hated the speed limiters on the oh, go kart. Yeah, that'd be the coolest. You'd shit. be like pedal to the metal, and you're like maxed out. You're like, damn, I want to go faster. Yeah. And of course, I'm tempted to go ram my cart into my friend. Like that would. Be... Well, they have these bumpers on them, so you're like, oh, it's probably fine, right? Yeah, we're good. They always like yell at you, They're like, hey, stop, yeah. stop doing that. Stop yeah. bumper cars. <laughs> yeah. So Action Park did put speed limiters in their go karts, but drivers found a way to get around it. All they had to do was shove a tennis ball into just the right spot toward the engine. Not only that, but the employees would even shove the tennis balls in there themselves upon request. I want to go fast. Make my cart go faster. Sure thing, buddy. We got it. Here you go. <laughs> what? Other employees would also do it to carts where the driver didn't even request it. Seems weird. So against your will, the employee would be like, nah, buddy, you're going fast today. Or it'd be like, there'd be a girl or something like, ah, I'm scared or something, you know, like too bad. The terrorizer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when the speed limiter wasn't engaged, these cars would go up to 50 miles per hour. That is absolutely insane. Which you've, if you've ever been on thinking about driving 50 miles per hour in a car is different than being on any sort of vehicle, whether it's an ATV, snowmobile, jet ski, let alone go kart at 50 miles per hour. I right. mean, you can't even see because the wind is going it's past so, so fast, fast. Right. And like, there's no suspension on these things. So, oh it's no, like it's insane. 50 miles an hour. I mean, like imagine, have you ever been on like a bike going 25 yeah, yeah. miles an hour? And you're like, like holy shit, pretty fast, I'm going right? super fast yeah. right now. So imagine in one of these suckers going 50. That's insane. That's just so wild. I mean, Imagine hitting somebody at 50 miles per hour in a go-kart. Severe. Hopefully they at least damage. made them put seatbelts on. Yeah, I think there was. Yes, there was. Like seat Jesus. Belts. Like, still like there was no, um, you could see pictures of these yeah. things. There's no like whiplash protectors yeah. or anything that you usually get on, on off-road vehicles or stuff like that. So yeah, it's just, uh, it's, good luck guys. Better hope you got a strong neck. <laughs> yeah. Cause your neck's about to take a beating. <laughs> Sometimes employees would even sneak the carts out at night and drive them at top speeds on the nearby highway. <laughs> like what? That's crazy, man. Crashes on the go-kart track happened often. And believe it or not, no helmets were required. Serious injuries were just one of the common risks whenever drivers whipped around the cement track. Some drivers would even turn around and drive straight toward other drivers causing countless head-on collisions. Whiplash and sprained necks were basically a feature of the ride. Basically, you just didn't go on this ride without coming off of it with a sprained neck or yeah. a whiplash of some sort. Either that or some, you know, your eyes being fucked up from something flying into your eye. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, what if, like, a piece of metal or something's, like, hitting you at 50 miles per hour? Like, this is why you wear visors on motorcycles. I didn't even like, think about that. Like, dude, or, like, a piece of trash somebody throws on the track. Right, it, yeah. A rock, a pebble. I don't, how many times have you been on the highway that pebbles come yeah, up? Yeah, hit your windshield, speed. cracks your and windshield. These guys were taking it out after hours, hitting up the highway. Dude, good times the '80s. I wish I was a teenager during it this was time. It is wild, man. Wild times in the '80s. So even if you drove safely, never collided with other cars, and finished the race in dead last, you still couldn't escape harm. <laughs> because on this ride, among all the other risks that you're you're assuming by getting on, you are inhaling gasoline fumes, and we're not just like a little bit of gasoline. We're talking about like serious gasoline fumes from you know think about a car that hasn't had a oil change in a while or you know has something wrong with the engine and you start getting that like thicker smoke coming out of the exhaust oh yeah that's what's happening on here so not only are you whipping around you're getting your neck whipped around i mean you're you're Can't taking breathe taking pebbles to the eye <laughs> you're also just <laughs> inhaling fumes toxic fumes into your lungs so actually riders would get sick from these fumes because the go-karts were so abused and poorly maintained and because they were jamming tennis balls into the engine. I mean, 
to make him go 50 miles per hour, which I'm sure was very, very bad for the engine. Oh, yeah, that cars. couldn't have been good. Yeah. I mean, imagine a, a teenager taking your car out every night and, and going as fast as possible <laughs> and returning it the next day where it gets smashed up with other kids inside. And there's My no God. way those engines were healthy no, at all. No. And just like slamming on them like, eh, yeah, like right, constantly. Eh, the brakes are just <laughs> toast. The engine's toast. <laughs> this is crazy, though. No one ever died while riding these super go-karts, which honestly blows my mind. I don't know how that's even possible. It seems like they were at least wearing seatbelts because hitting somebody, like bumping into someone going 50 miles per hour with no seatbelt on, you're getting ejected from yeah, that Absolutely, go-kart. yeah. So the, the thing about it, though, is that, you know, you might have had a very exciting time on the go-karts. You might be feeling a little wheezy after because the fumes and a little hot because on that cement with all those tires burning rubber, like, you know what? Let's head over to the water world part. Let's go take a dip. But believe it or not, this side of the park is potentially where you might die because it's that dangerous, which is crazy. Because even from a distance, guests could see how insane the cannonball loop was. This was the cause of so many injuries. The state of New Jersey shut it down after only one month of operation. So imagine this if you're, if you're not watching. This ride was an enclosed slide, dark, and it wasn't the only enclosed slide in the park. But this was the only one that had a 45 degree slide that ended in a small vertical loop at the end. So you're going down, full on loop. Which you don't see this design anywhere. No. Because of how dangerous that is to go down, go fast, and then literally go upside down inside of the slide yeah. and out and then get ejected into the water. The ride looks so absurd that the park owner offered employees $100 to test it out before opening it to the public. I don't know if this is going to work, Jimmy, but here's a hundred bucks. Let's see what happens. <laughs> don't tell your mom. Yeah. yeah. God. Oh, it, it's just crazy that they were able to get away with this. So this idea of like having the employees test out the rides was actually really common since action park was one of the first modern water parks. There wasn't, much money put into the physics and engineering of it. It's just kind of like trial and error. It's like, let's build. I have this idea, man. Yeah. This sounds awesome. This is like a plot of jackass or something. Yeah, like right. Honestly. Yeah. Like, they were pioneers here just creating rides that were insane. We're not going to actually like get somebody smart to like make this, man. Yeah. We're just going to kind of guesstimate it. Yeah. And, like, it's a water slide. How yeah. hard could it be? Yeah. It's right? just a loop de loop, man. Yeah. <laughs> Can't be that bad. So, on top of not only not having it properly engineered and designed, they also didn't hire proper maintenance crew. Almost everything was left up to the teenage employees because they're super cheap and you probably save so much money that yeah. way. And they're all geniuses and <laughs> yeah. no proper engineering exactly. and nothing will ever go wrong. Exactly. One of the employees that took the money called himself an idiot and said that $100 did not buy enough booze to drown out that memory. It's <laughs> a great quote. Another employee ended up going through the slide in full hockey gear. One of the rumors surrounding this the slide mentioned test dummies that they had launched through the slide to see if it was safe. When the dummy shot out of the end, some of them had been dismembered and decapitated. Oh my God. It's good to go. Cause guys. like, think about it. If you're going down the slide, you're going fast. You're going to get airborne. It, this idea that just like gravity is going to like cling you to the slide. Yeah. Like you're going fast. Cause chances are, depending on how much you weigh, how fast, you know, the velocity is you're going down that slide. You're yep. either going to stick to the slide and be able to go around that loop or you're just going to you're going to just shoot into the the top of the loop you're there. already putting more thought into it than any of these <laughs> I engineers know, did. i know they're like velocity what yeah what I'm just yeah. trying to go fast yeah. man what about weight and momentum right Never exactly heard of it. Yeah. Not, and not like taking in the different factors of you know maybe like all the teenagers go through it just fine but then you get like a mom or you know an older person or heavier person and they go down and yeah like, or like a small kid or doesn't small have enough kid momentum or something ping yeah. pong off of the yeah. <laughs> the inside oh man so the dummies you know they're like you know they're seeing dismembered decapitated dummies they're like ah it's all right it's they're just it's just the dummies right yeah so after surviving the run this one particular employee said it was more like a ride you ride to survive than to have fun a former Navy physician once claimed that if a rider had enough speed, they could reach nine G's of force inside the loop. What? So let me put that, that in get a rocket back on. Yeah, you. that's nine G's is a ton. So I don't know how accurate that is. I couldn't look more into the 
the Navy physician and how they figured that out because obviously now that ride is not in operation. But so to put that into perspective, the highest G force on a roller coaster ride ever recorded is 6.5. Okay. Now, nine obviously, on a slide, right? Nine on a water slide. What? Also, we do have to take into account all the rides that have existed before we were even testing G force. So it might be possible that this was reaching nine G's, but we talked about stunt plane pilots and, yeah, and yeah. fighter pilots and stuff. Um, they can handle with training, they can handle 10 to 12 G's, but the average person can handle maybe five to 10 G's before passing out. This so, this Navy guy is full of shit because yeah, nine, nine G's? G's would be a lot. But if you look at the loop on this water slide, it might be possible. If you have enough speed and you go into that small of a loop, that is a lot of G's being put on your I body. Guess, yeah. So they such a tight loop. Yeah. We can give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm not sure if nine G's is accurate, but it, it would be. A considerable amount. What are, of what are they? What are they launching you out of a cannon at the top? <laughs> right. What the hell? There's no way anybody's getting nine G's of force, or or speed enough to hit nine G's of force through yeah. this slide. If if the loop is small enough, that's basically what would determine. But since we don't really have the stats on that slide today, we're not really sure. That's crazy. But have you ever heard of the euthanasia roller coaster concept? Uh. Uh-uh. This was the first thing I thought of when I heard that there were high G's in this ride. So a few years back, this Lithuanian engineer named Julie Jonas Urbanos, uh, he was in, he was a PhD candidate in design interactions and he had this concept to build a ride that would euthanize people with, uh, if they had terminal illnesses, you know, so he would basically engineer a ride that would kill them but it would also put them through uh, euphoria before they died. Oh, interesting. He called it a, quote, whole body engaging and ritualized death machine. And the whole purpose was to be enjoyable before dying. Uh, The idea was to build a 1,600 foot tall roller coaster that would last approximately three minutes. It would start with a huge plunge to gain momentum and then several loops that got smaller in size so it could sustain at least 10 Gs. The first two minutes, we're climbing the lift hill. So you're going up a lift. Yeah, very okay. slow. You know, you've been on yeah. a big roller coaster, so you got so two, two minutes, minutes of the ride is that's going how up the high up you're going. It's very slow. Imagine Basically, your thoughts on that one. Exactly. That's exactly why he did so it. So you're just like reflecting as you're going. Oh my you're God. like, did I one? Am I making the right decision? And two, you know, reflecting on life. If you're if you're satisfied that this is the end, you yeah. Know? So wow. he g- gives you a little time. And then once you reach the top, you could maybe give a few last words, say you love your family, say goodbye. There's like one of those little like photo cameras there. Like, yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Smile for the camera. Yeah. Oh my God. And then you would make the plunge. And so it would take essentially one minute to die from this ride. Once you hit that first loop, the 10 G's would hit your body. So all the blood in your brain, because you're sitting upright, all the blood in your brain would then start moving into your legs. So, so you're starving your brain of, of oxygen, of oxygen. Right. So you slowly, you, get, you can kind of feel, I don't know. Have so you, you ever, get like lightheaded? You'd be like, yeah, you just pass and then out essentially and go unconscious. And then once that the 10 G's are sustained enough, all that blood is rushing out and you eventually pass away. Oh my God. But he, he said that specifically he wanted to do that because you do get supposedly a sense of euphoria for having a lack of oxygen in your head. So he was like, they would just be in complete euphoria and they wouldn't feel anything essentially besides the end there. And Mm. he would go peacefully. So that was, that was the ride. And later, roller coaster. yeah, euthanasia roller coaster. Look it up. It's, it's pretty wild. And you can actually see the design. It's basically a huge drop loop. And then the The loops get continuously smaller. Later, a NASA engineer perfected it. And uh, it's funny enough, he, he realized, well, this wouldn't work for some people, especially without legs, because they wouldn't have the oh, room for the blood to, pull to the drain. Too. Yeah. So he was like, we need to tweak this a bit. So, because imagine having a terminal patient on there that ended up not dying oh, by the yeah. end of the ride, you know? So well, I mean, when all the blood came back, you'd be 
you'd be like, what just happened? Yeah. 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 So obviously this is still just a concept. It was never built. Um, But yeah, this cannonball loop really reminded me of that. Because if you get a small enough loop and that high enough G's starts affecting your body like that. That's crazy. But at least in a roller coaster, you're strapped in. Yeah. On the slide, you're just, it's you in between this, this metal or plastic slide and water. Yep. In your bathing suit. And, and the thing about the enclosed slides is that you can't fucking see because no, water is flying in your face. So yeah. You're just, you're just in the dark, eyes closed, getting pounded with water. Yep. Hoping that this isn't the end. <laughs> oh my God. This is like a death loop. <laughs> yeah. So the faster riders could potentially pass out. If smaller riders didn't have enough speed on the cannonball loop, they would often get caught at the top. With no momentum, they would then slip down one side or the other and smash into the sides before landing at the bottom which this ended with countless broken noses and back injuries. Some of the riders would also lose their teeth. Oh, after their faces smashed into the walls of the slide. And when the next riders would shoot through the loop, some came out with long gashes and blood pulsing from their backs. And so employees would go in there and be like, what the hell is going on? Is there some like piece of the slide sticking out? No. Human teeth that had been knocked out were jammed into the slide and people were running over them. Oh my God. So when the riders had slid through the loop, the embedded teeth had sliced open their backs. And after so many injuries, employees were told to weigh the potential riders, remove all their jewelry, and hose them down to make them slick enough to pass through the loop. Park management also installed a hatch at the bottom of the loop to extract the riders who got stuck. Even though death seemed inevitable in the cannonball loop, the state quickly shut the ride down before anyone could kill themselves. It opened a few more times in 1995 and 1996, but only for a few days. Too many injuries forced the park to shut the ride down again and the slide sat there unused for the rest of Waterworld's existence. Another feature at this water park was the tidal wave pool. I actually love wave pools. Same. But after hearing this, I don't know if I'll get back in one. (laughs) Here, you didn't have to worry about getting smashed or sliced open. You just had to worry about drowning, which drowning is a horrible way to die. This wave pool operated like many others. It was a 100 by 200 foot pool where a machine generated waves. Most wave pools are only mildly dangerous, but here at Action Park, death was so imminent that lifeguards had to save as many as 30 people every single weekend, and 12 lifeguards had to be on duty at all times. The problem was like all the other problems at Action Park, the poor design. The machine produced massive waves, and instead of pushing them into the shallow water, so that's the point of it, is it's supposed to push all the guests towards the, the shore, essentially. Yep. But no, this one was so powerful that you... You know, depending on how far back you were, you're not even going to make it there because the force of it drawing the water back into the machine was way stronger. That's scary. And and if you've, I, I know at Waterworld here in, in Denver, I've swam to the back on the back wall there where there's vents, like yes. where the water gets sucked in there. Right. Yeah. Right. And thinking action. back on it, like as a kid, I'm like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. Not thinking that like somebody could be sucked in there. For sure. I don't know even the safety mechanisms of modern wave pools, really. There's, I don't know that there really is. Like, you just got to be a good swimmer. Yeah. Or hope the lifeguard's paying attention. Yeah. Also, the lifeguards. If I'm ever going to a pool and I see 12 lifeguards on duty, I'll be yeah. like, you know what? Not going in well, this pool. Yeah. Which, I mean, like, the our water world here, I would say there's probably, like, I don't know, at least six or eight, though. Like, there's there's definitely a lot. And I think just wave pools in general, people like getting in them. Because a lot of people will get like inner tubes. Oh, yep. You know, maybe you're not a super strong swimmer. So you bring an inner tube out in the wave pool. And then the fun part is like riding the top of the wave in the inner tube. It's fucking dangerous because you got people coming over the top of you with inner tubes smashing into you. I mean, it's just a dangerous uh, ride, I guess we call or pool. It's just a dangerous pool. Yeah, I would would go to it was called Red Oaks Water Park. Shout out uh, to Michigan. (laughs) But yeah, it was actually more dangerous in the shallow end. I right, remember as a right. kid, yeah, because the waves pushed got on way you. higher. Yeah, and so yeah, especially the inner tubes, you get smacked around. God bless it. Seriously. <laughs> so, obviously, those who aren't strong swimmers, as the wave pools pulling all the water back into the the wave making machine, they'd realize that they were in deep water. I mean, we're talking it's it's deep out out there, and. This would be all right if you could just swim back into the shallow waters, but here at Action Park, they were crammed as many as a thousand people in the wave pool, shoulder to shoulder, 
that's crazy i think there is like a limit of how many people can go into the wave pool now yeah um, because yeah if there's too many people in there that's such a hazard because a 12 lifeguards ain't going to save a thousand people right. or even a tiny percentage of that i mean that that's a lot of people and if you're shoulder to shoulder everyone's going to be smashing into each other heads yeah. are going to hit how, how would you even know if you were a lifeguard how would you even how would see you know? someone drowning i know i i always wonder that too in a wave pool how do you even know if somebody's actually drowning or not right there's already a risk there because it might take a lifeguard a few minutes to realize that you're even drowning yeah right and like you can't even count on people screaming because you go to the wave pool it's like yeah it's kids screaming right, all the exactly. time so <laughs> So when the waves got too rough, people would panic and scramble toward the shallow end or the side ladders, and they would climb over other swimmers while trying to get there. So this wave pool opened in 1981, and by the next year, it swallowed its first victim, 15-year-old George Lopez. Two years later, Donald DePass, a 20-year-old from Brooklyn, also drowned. And another visitor, 18-year-old Gregory Grandchamps, drowned in 1987. State regulations failed to address the problem since the tidal wave pool was considered a pool, and not a ride under state regulations, which meant that Action Park only had to keep the pool clean and have enough lifeguards on duty. Without the lifeguards, many more people would have drowned, for sure. And even with the 12 on duty, people still drowned. And this got the wave pool the nickname, the Grave Pool. Another fatality at Waterworld was over at the Kayak Experience. The ride was an imitation whitewater course like the Thunder River Rapids ride, but here they submerged fans in the water to simulate the effect. As guests paddle through the water in a single-seater kayak, they would often tip over from the rough waves. They often had to swim out of the kayak and stand in the shallow water and turn the kayak right side up. 27-year-old Jeffrey Nathan went to tip his kayak over on August 1st, 1982. Two of his relatives were in kayaks nearby, and they watched as Jeffrey stepped out into the shallow water with his bare feet. He happened to touch a metal grate beneath the water when suddenly his body stiffened and violently shook before falling into the water face down. His relatives felt an intense surge of electricity through the water even though they were further away. Jeffrey sadly immediately went into cardiac arrest and once they could get him to safety and the paramedics arrived they rushed him to a hospital in Warwick, New York where he later died from shock induced cardiac arrest. The ride was then immediately closed and drained after investigation. After his death the park argued that the electric shock hadn't killed him since there were no visible burns on his body. But even the coroner said that burns usually don't occur when you're shocked from water-based electrocution, which makes sense. Yeah. Investigators then discovered an exposed wire from one of the underwater fans that had come in contact with the metal grate Jeffrey had stepped on. Park officials said the exposed wire was just a nick, but others claimed it was 8 inches. For unknown reasons, the state's labor department claimed that the fan was properly installed and maintained. They also added that no violations of safety laws or regulations had occurred on the kayak experience, but they did say that there was an electrical current flowing through a ground circuit that could cause bodily harm under certain circumstances. The ride never reopened because the park thought no one would want to go on the kayak experience again, which is probably a good call. Yep. But countless other sketchy rides and attractions filled the water park. There was one called the Tarzan Swing, which was a 20-foot long cable that swung the guests out into a freezing cold, spring-fed pool. Once the guests had the cable in their hands, they knew they were the center of attention. Some of the drunken men and women would often expose themselves to the cheering crowd before launching off the platform. Hell yeah. Someone hold on too long and scrape their feet on the concrete wall across the way. Others would plunge into the freezing water and be so shocked by the cold they couldn't even swim, so lifeguards would have to rescue them. One man even died from a heart attack in 1984 just after launching from the swing. Near the swing, people would dive from the concrete cliffs whenever they wanted. Slides with no edges shot into the pools, and in another ride, drunken guests would drive the single-seater mini speedboats ride and crash into each other. It's just absolute mayhem at Action Park. Plus, the park was known for its disregard for alcohol laws. Oh, shocker! Man. Terrible idea. Get yeah. people drunk and control their intensity of their rides. Several kiosks across the park sold beer to people well below the drinking age, especially the employees. Oh my God. And many doctors noticed that people they treated with injuries from Action Park were often intoxicated. In the summer of 1987, over 100 injuries were treated, and doctors said that they admitted 5 to 10 people a day, a day, from Action Park. This whole park basically existed under one principle. The guest is in control of their destiny. It would eventually be the cause. This would eventually be the cause of the park's downfall. 
Under today's regulations, Action Park wouldn't have survived for more than a month. But back in the 80s, baby, regulations were much more relaxed. It was just such a chill time. <laughs> By the 90s, several lawsuits were filed against the park, few won in court, but the court costs and legal defense teams started costing the park too much money. On top of this, the owner, Eugene Mulvihill, pled guilty to five charges of insurance fraud. And by the next year, Eugene's company, Great American Recreation, filed for bankruptcy. Action Park closed at the end of 1996 summer season and didn't reopen the next year. Eugene actually passed away in 2012. But over the years, the property was handed around from investor to investor and its name changed back and forth. Renovations and safety upgrades have been installed throughout the years, and today the park exists under new ownership as Mountain Creek Water Park. At least six known fatalities and countless injuries have happened in Action Park. And while most are relieved the park no longer exists the way it did in the 80s, some still think Action Park was an initiation for kids in New Jersey. One guest, Chris Gethard, later wrote, When I get to talking about it with other Jerseyans, we share stories as if we were veterans who served in combat together. I suspect that many of us may have come closest to death on some of those rides up in Vernon Valley. I consider it a true shame that future generations will never know the terror of proving their grit at New Jersey's most dangerous amusement park. Uh, that's a good thing, I would say. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is like a badge of honor, but uh, probably not worth it, really. Yeah, probably not worth risking your entire life for some thrill at a at a park it's clear to me that because there's alcohol everywhere that likely these injuries went up because of that right like it, i'd wonder how many injuries there would have been had there been no alcohol served at this park right yeah. i would assume it would go down a little bit yeah but then at all, least the exposing part the fun would also go down a little bit too yeah <laughs> that's true <laughs> that's true a part of me it's weird because a part of me it's like terrifying that these parks existed like this but a small part kind of, of me is I like, I wish I could have experienced it for myself, you know? I think that's how most of us would feel. It'd be like, if I knew what I know now and I went there and I didn't like push push it too much, you'd probably have a really good day. Yeah. And, and clearly tons of people had a great time there. Right. And never experienced any injuries or, um, or died as a result of visiting Action Park. Right. So, I mean, it's just like, it's, it's the same thing of how extreme sports have evolved over the years, right? Like we've gotten better with safety and regulations and things like that, but it's kind of, that's kind of what the danger part of it is what made it an extreme sport to start with, right? It's like going into extreme sports, you assume the risk, you know, people that jump motorcycles and, and, you know, go down giant half pipes and things like that. Like you assume the risk that you could potentially die. Right. From yeah, this. Very true but you do it for the love of the sport for the thrill you know some people are just adrenaline junkies and yeah you can't you can't get into formula one racing without right knowing knowing that, that you could potentially get in a wreck and die or be you know severely injured as a yeah. result so to that i, I kind of understand well it's, it kind of reminds me the action park reminds me a lot of mckamey manor the extreme yes. haunt uh, attraction i remember that episode because it's like part of you is like this should not exist. People should not be allowed to do this to other people. But at the same time, depending on who you are, this might be exactly what you want to do. That, that's the appeal, right? Is that things go too far? Sometimes. Is it going too far? Is it criminal what he's doing? Um, Russ uh, over there at McCamey Manor, which I believe is still going on. Is it really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It still, still goes on today. And for me, I'm like, well, I think you should be able to, if you want to assume risk like obviously for that there's physical risk but psychological oh, trauma yeah. from that is 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 a real thing so it's like for me I, I think as long as you are aware of the risks why should you not be able to do uh, an experience right it's it's the same thing with like psychedelic drugs right the fact that the government prohibits you from doing that that is completely wrong in my opinion like i think people should have every right to do what they want with their bodies and do what they want for fun and as long as it's not hurting another person, right? You're not hurting, and that's where McCamey Manor comes in. Like, well, they're actually hurting other people, there. right? Yeah. But you're asking for it. You've signed up for that experience. So yeah. it's like, should you rob people of these experiences just because they're inherently dangerous and could potentially kill them? Right. And I know the problem with um, McCamey Manor was people were trying to do safe words, 
but they were still locked in. I think that's the main crux of the yeah. issue, right? Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, we can go through this intensity. I want out. But yeah. They're like, too when bad. You this? ain't getting out. Right, yeah. yeah. You signed that I can do what I want with you. Yeah. But I guess that's the same for Action Park, right? You, If you begin that water slide, there's no exit. You got to go through it, right? So, what do you think, Daniel? Would you uh, go to Action Park? Would you do uh, or McCamey Manor? I would not go to McCamey Manor, but Action Park, fuck yeah, yeah, <laughs> I would have a lot of fun with that place. So, I've been reading this article from uh, Wired, and this guy is explaining the physics behind Action Park and the uh, the Cannonball Loop, and he's saying that they would actually need to hit over ten G's, which is like thirty three miles an hour, entering the loop just to make it to the top. That's crazy. So that's not even legit. So it's legit then. Yeah. They would wow, literally be yeah. pulling nine Gs. So not that. only were they to, pulling nine Gs, you had to pull nine Gs to just, just get, to get through, through the loop. <laughs> so the amount of people that didn't pull nine Gs and would end up on just like smashing the stuff. sides, I think, because that was the thing. People were reaching the top and then falling back down on the other side of the slide, smashing the their faces and shit. So they're just like slinging themselves down the slide and it's high enough that they're able to pull that it's like 33 miles per hour yeah say a small prayer so you oh reach 33 God. miles it's like it's like back to the future you gotta hit that speed to to <laughs> get through crazy, it crazy man i think that's why they smartened up after they sent so many people because remember they were they were like okay remove your jewelry we're gonna hose yeah, you down you right. have to be within this weight limit so i think they started to smarten up about it but i met <laughs> not enough <laughs> yeah not enough <laughs> What do you think? Do you think people should be able to do these types of attractions though if they want to, like assume the risk? Or should it just be like shut down completely? Like n no parks or attractions like this should exist? I mean, I definitely think that there should be clear warnings and maybe have like a little, you know, class beforehand explaining like, hey, right. you're going to die. And that, yeah. that might happen. Well, yeah. it's like skydiving, right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, every, yeah. every time you go skydiving, you always assume the risk. There's a 50 50, 50 chance I've. Yeah, is it? 50, I splat 50? on the ground. No, I don't no, know. Okay. I don't know. I no, say, that's a. I just shit. pulled that out of my ass. But in my mind, that's how I see it. I'm like, there's a 50 50 percent chance that I yeah, could die or not for sure. Because it's like, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a much higher percentage of survival for skydiving. Otherwise, no, no one would do it if it's 50 50. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> well, but it, there might be a few. It might be like a euthanasia, uh, right. Skydiving thing. Yeah. Right. Right. So that's okay. Like people. And that's the thing is I think you can do these extreme things while being relatively safe. Like you can increase your chances of like wearing a helmet if you're going down a, a basically a skateboard on concrete or you're in a go kart wearing a seatbelt and in a helmet and a visor. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like there's things that you can do to mitigate a lot of that risk. But at the end of the day, it's like. It's up to you. I mean, if you want to do, anybody can go do any, these people that free climb these buildings and stuff. Like, oh, yeah. That shit's crazy to me. It's like, why? People just want to do it. Or yeah. people that climb Mount Everest, you know? It's like, why? Yeah. Why climb? It's for the thrill. It's for the adventure. It's for the, I, there's something about like that release of adrenaline. And I know for me personally, I love that feel of like some action happening or like you're, you know, you find yourself in a situation where, your adrenaline gets pumping and it's like it's something you always remember right yeah i mean i i will admit that the most fun i've ever had in my life was going 70 80 miles an hour off-roading in the middle of the desert oh Just yeah high speeds in yeah. a roll cage off-road vehicle i i have been chasing the dragon ever since then so like right. i totally get it that people want that i wonder if the big question is though it's the fact that it's a for-profit like company that's running it and there are people dying i think maybe that's what's wrong because like yeah we should allow people to hit those adrenaline junkie hits but maybe the fact that it's in a controlled environment plus there are children involved right maybe right, like that's right. playing into the controversy but the other thing too i was going to say is if you look at action sports extreme sports you got like a trained medical crew on on you know, location ready to take you to the hospital. There's a helicopter there. You know what I mean? It's like you could be prepared for that. It seems like Action Park was like, no. You got a drunken teenager yeah. running down, to running help to get you a out. first aid kit to yeah. stick on your cracked skull. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. Here, bro, Here's a here band aid, go. dude. Wrap yeah. his head. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if you're gonna have these like extreme rides, I think you got to have like 
you know, at least a quick way to get help right. if something goes wrong. Very true. Right? I mean, that's like the very least you can do for your paying customers, right? That's very true. Make sure yeah. that they can get help quickly. I mean, he must have been making some bank too. A million people a year at that place. That's Come a on. lot. That is a lot. I'm not sure what the operating costs are, but surprising that with these types of rides that only six died that we know of. Like, yeah, it's actually almost kind of that's, small. That's, I feel like that's not even, I feel like there might be some like hidden stuff that, that hasn't come out. That's what we know of. Yeah. Cause that many people through those rides and that's all like a few hundred injuries and six deaths over, you know, a number of years. Like that's, that's wild. And I don't think they were above pushing things under the rug and yeah, hiding it because yeah. we know from that first incident where they're, employee died he was like a ski lift operator cracked his skull on the alpine slide they did try and cover that up they were like well we didn't have to report it to the state because he was an employee so how many other potential employees oh i'm maybe sure there's were way more at least like injured right it's probably countless i'm sure there's way more that we don't even know yeah but with that being said we want to know who's been to action park i don't know it might be a little bit uh some of our or I hate to age ourselves, but some of us who were, you know, running around in our teens in the 90s, if any of you visited Action Park before it closed or have been to the replacement park that's there now. Yeah. Um, or really to any of these parks that we mentioned today. But yeah, let us know in the comments. We really uh, enjoy these episodes. Um, they're, I mean, they're obviously still dark and tragic and everything, but there's just, there's something like weirdly intriguing about like looking into it because it's like, it's, experiences that we all can relate to i feel like i think most of us have been to amusement parks and so you know i know when i'm going through some of these stories i'm like thinking about my own experiences through some of these parks or you know like ricky old wooden roller coaster definitely been on one of those before yeah, where the whole thing's like shaking i'm like this could just go down it shouldn't point. exist yeah it's like there's something about that experience and that thrill that doesn't stop us you know yeah. from going back and visiting theme parks i mean Florida's got a whole industry because of theme parks and we know even Disney people have died at Disney. So Absolutely, yeah. it's just the kind of a risk that we're all willing to take in order to get some thrills and chills for a day. Right. So that wraps it up for us today though. We will see you guys next week with another episode of lights out podcast. So much good stuff coming your way again. Make sure you're following us on Spotify and subscribe on YouTube. We'd really appreciate it, but we will see you next time. And until then lights out everybody.